Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Emily Burns. Thank you for joining us uh, for the second day of a uh, symposium on relatedness in North American art. A symposium thinking about the historiography of North American art through the lens of cultural projections of being behind, without history, without tradition. There are a few people who are just joining us today, so I'll reiterate um, that this series, which is the culmination of a four-part series um, hosted and organized um, through the Court Hall's um, Institute's um, Center for American Art, um, is focusing on the cultural politics between so-called old and new worlds and within cultures and nations of North America, the baggage of temporalities, the tensions between normative time and progress and its alternatives, and the writings of histories of North American art within the field of art history as a whole. Relatedness we defined as being framed through constructs of being behind, delayed, or not yet arrived. Yesterday, I offered a more philosophical introduction to the concept. Um, and today, um, by way of introduction, I want to explore some of its pragmatics as I see them related to the writing of North American art history. As many US Americanists have been taught through historiographic articles by Wanda Korn and John Davis, the field of US art history did not emerge smoothly through the art historical discipline, but rather through fits and spurts of interest of Asianist art historian Benjamin Rowland at Harvard, who encouraged students to investigate the rich early American collections in Boston museums, and also through the American mind scholars in American studies, who were, were concurrently probing questions of defining US cultural nationalism and exceptionalism. And these writers frequently took up American painting in support of that project. This pairing prompted obsessive questioning of the Americanness in American art and a belated and oft awkward enfolding of this burgeoning subfield into the wider field of art history, in which it is still at times relegated to the margins. I don't know if you have had this experience too, but I've occasionally heard of art historical departments thinking like that American art is not a valid field of necessary inquiry to include in a department, which still um, uh, rankles, I suppose. Um, but redoubling this marginalization, the canon of US American art also left aside and minoritized many histories of art, especially outside the United States, um, in uh, neighboring Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean, and also in histories of African American and Native American art production. How too has belatedness participated in and reinforced inherited narratives about American modernism? How has anxiety of influence shaped a history of late 19th century American art that still canonizes artists like Winslow Homer and Thomas Aikens, painters who spent only brief periods in the late 1860s abroad, over the much more standard practice of extended um, international study? How have narratives of progress in art framed by abstraction pointedly rendered figuration as belated or anti-modern, or as Leon posted yesterday, better suited to political exigencies? North American artist aesthetic choices are often responsive to wider cultural politics that consistently frame parts of the continent's art practice as delayed or derivative or perpetually incipient until that became an asset, coinciding with the rise of the US as a global superpower in the 1940s. And by this period in the mid 20th century, how did abstract expressionism critically signify an arrival, a coming of age through that same trope of the new? How did the writing of art criticism and later art history naturalize these assumptions that American artists were perpetually behind European models and come to use derivation as a foil for this moment of arrival? This is something that's really uh, vexing me in the writing the epilogue to my present book project. And I see it as a crystallization of a myth that operates as an assumption that falls out of sight. With this macro and micro history in mind, a key question for today is, where do we find layered projections of belatedness around and within the fields that have written North American art history? Perhaps belatedness's unease emerges from the impossibility of rendering temporality beyond the local to the national or the global scales. As film study scholar Bliss Claude Lim argues in Translating Time, Cinema, the Fantastic and Temporal Critique of 2009, quote, the rhetoric of anachronism is consistently employed by proponents of homogenous time whenever a stubborn heterogeneity is encountered. 
one comes to expect that whenever anachronism is shouted, conflicting coexisting times are being hastily denounced. Where do we find artists who have productively leveraged the possibilities for conflicting and coexisting times? Indeed, artists and culture producer, producers have not merely been victims of an imposed belatedness. Homiki Baba, for instance, has intimated that belatedness operates as a tool of othering, but also a space for liberation, as it undergirds the, quote, disjunctive temporalities of national culture, which are ever unstable and in formation. In its own articulations from the periphery for Baba, quote, a sense of secondariness or belatedness enters into the structure of the original. And I'm ending the quote from him there to say that this practice deflects a unified or totalized or homogenized culture. In other words, belatedness can be interruptive. Baba asks, how does one narrate the present as a form of contemporaneity that is always belated? And he introduces a slippage here that becomes emancipatory. Today's sessions will think through this temporal suppression as it relates to the writings of versions of North American art and history. And I will introduce the full slate of speakers as yesterday at the start of the session by their title, institution, and one of their publications that has um, stood out to me vis-a-vis um, -vis this project. And I encourage you to look to, their web to our website for the conference for their full bios. And as of yesterday, we'll hear both papers and then have discussion after the talks. Um, so first up today will be um, Dr. Elizabeth Hutchinson, who is the Toe Associate Professor of Art History at Barnard College at Columbia University. She is author of The Indian Craze, Primitivism, Modernism, and Transculturation in American Art, 1890 to 1915, in 2009, and many articles about Native American and settler dialogues um, uh, through um, in which she frequently explores questions of whom has defined modernity and how, and how Native American artists have interrupted settler constructs of modern progress that have written them out of histories of modernism. She also tends to shifting contexts that shape meaning, such as in a 2013 essay from Pantheon to Indian Gallery, Art and Sovereignty on the Early 19th Century Frontier, which is an essay from the Journal of American Studies that I love talking about with my students, um, because it shows how later understandings of Native American ethnographic representations occluded our clarity of how these images operated as tools for diplomacy and sovereignty in the period in which they were made, thus encouraging us to, quote, pay more attention to what we actually see rather than what later visual paradigms have trained us to expect. And Tani Sheehan is the Ellerton M. and Edith K. Jetty Professor of Art at Colby College, and has for a long time been editor of the Archives of American Art Journal. She is author of um, multiple books on race and photography that effectively probe not only depictions of non-white sitters, but also think through how medium and materiality themselves incited anxieties about racial difference. And she has long been a crucial voice in the field of both American and African American art history. Where do we look for race? She probes as she explores in the Blackwell um, Companion to American Art, centering a temporal question of, quote, not only where, but also when do we look for representations of and ideas about race? Um, and I think this is a key um, question as we're thinking about these historiographies. So thank you both in advance for your talks, and Elizabeth, I invite you to the podium. Thanks. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Emily, and it's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm grateful for the hospitality of the Courtauld and the wonderful organizational uh, capacities of its staff, and, and really happy to see all of you on a Saturday morning. I, I imagine there are other things you might also be doing. Uh, <clears throat> In November 1971, John I. Bauer, director of the Whitney Museum of American Art, proclaimed the museum's recently opened exhibition, 200 Years of American Indian Art, one of the most successful exhibitions in the museum's history. He went on to explain, quote, it is rare enough to have a show of superlative quality. It is rarer to have one that elicits both the critical and popular response that this one does. George Weissman, one of the corporate sponsors of the exhibition, added on that the exhibition, quote, set a new high mark in recognition of American art. 
adding, in these times, when we are concerned with the ethnic and disadvantaged sections of our population, I think the show has performed more than just an aesthetic fulfillment. Despite the dated language, Weissman's sentiment rhymes well with major American museums' more recent reinstallations of permanent collections, which incorporate Native American art in their American galleries. The trend may have begun with the Brooklyn Museum installation American Identities, opened September 2001, which included examples of indigenous North and South American art alongside European American works from both continents. New installations at Crystal Bridges and reinstallations at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and the Metropolitan Museum followed um, in subsequent decades. And two years ago, the Philadelphia Museum of Art unveiled its new early American galleries, um, which did the same kind of integration. Work is underway in Houston, Portland, Maine, and elsewhere. The Philadelphia Art Museum's website explains their choice. Quote, the 10,000 square foot space has been installed to tell the story of how Philadelphia became the young nation's cultural capital and how black, indigenous, and Latin American artists contributed to the development of American art. As this quotation demonstrates, these projects specifically respond to a growing demand for BIPOC inclusion in American museums, something that is vitally important but that can also undermine the fact that indigeneity is a political, not a racial category. At the end of this talk, I will return to these recent reinstallations. But first, I want to look at the Whitney's 1971 exhibition to explore if and how it integrated Native American work into the story of American art. This will lay the groundwork for considering if and how the current reinstallations are a belated next step in the Whitney's work. Two hundred years of American Indian art included 314 pieces produced north of Mexico between 1700 and 1900. It was accompanied by a catalog which illustrated about half of the works. Unable to find any color images of the exhibition, and I'm going to apologize in advance that many of my slides come from scanned newspapers, um, but I'll be illustrating this talk using the color plates from the catalog, which give a strong sense of the kind of presentation that the museum offered. Um, spare, modernist objects isolated from one another in um, individual cases with minimal labeling. <clears throat> this was not the first major exhibition of Native American art at an American art museum. There were important precedents at MoMA and art museums in Seattle, Denver, and Houston, among others. But this was, I believe, the first that showed indigenous art in an explicitly American context. And I'm using American the way we from the United States use it in a nationalist way, like just us, just our country. Um, the exhibition and catalog were organized by culture area, an anthropological paradigm imposed on native nations with individual histories and complex relations to one another. And there was minimal labeled information in keeping with modern art museums house style. Most of the works were displayed in cylindrical cases with a striated charcoal background and a birch base, giving the cases something of a look of trees in a forest. As I will elaborate, despite the subject matter being unusual for a major American art museum, the presentation reinforced ma many age-old stereotypes associating Native people with nature, warfare, pagan religion, and the past. And indeed, I could have written a paper on belatedness in terms of thinking through the perpetual primitivization of indigenous art, but I'm, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction, as I've indicated. 200 Years was organized by Norman Fetter, then curator of Native American art at the Denver Art Museum. The exhibition came together quickly. The Whitney board approved it only a year before the opening, and Fetter was brought in in the spring of 1971. He had recently used a sabbatical to visit European collections and was anxious to bring some little-known pieces back to the American continent. And he was pleased by the historical restriction of the show. He wrote, as he wrote in the exhibition catalog and elsewhere, while there had been exciting developments in Native American art with the introduction of new materials from Europeans, authentic Native work had begun a slow, continual decline not long after contact and was in 1970, poised for disappearance. 
to Fetter, who had not studied art history or anthropology, but who came to museum work through his experience as a hobbyist who replicated Native American objects, there was a strong distinction between Native art and Native craft. He restricted the word art for objects he saw as inventive and imaginative, a bias that led him to privilege the work of male artists and objects closely associated with shamanism, personal visionary experience, and on the Northwest Coast, crest imagery. The exhibition checklist is dominated by masks and includes numerous dance wands, carved pipe stones, figurative representations of more than human beings, and uh, this drum and shield decorated with visionary images. In addition, there are war clubs, painted shirts, and other items associated with conflict. Although Feather acknowledged the technical skill and productivity of women, he felt that their work, quote, was allowed very little freedom and expression, and that craftspeople needed to adhere to rigid standards of color, design, and techniques. Uh, he said wrongly that it would be impossible to distinguish the work of one craftswoman from another. Fetter's dismissal of women's work may reflect his own feelings about gender, but it also conforms with how Phil Deloria has characterized the Indian hobbyists of his generation. As Deloria writes, settler men who were attracted to Native culture in the mid-20th century sought to cultivate a sense of authenticity and individuality in a time characterized by social detachment and anomie. Quote, many post-war constructions of ethnic and racial others emphasized close interior qualities that encouraged white appreciation and self-discovery. Fetter was what Deloria characterizes as an object lobbyist who learned Native material culture through its reproduction. He had founded the magazine American Indian Hobbyist in 1954 and used this platform to promote the use of historical materials and techniques. This experience gave Fetter expertise in identifying objects he encountered in collections, but it reinforced a bias toward pre-20th century work. Importantly, Deloria notes that Quote, for object hobbyists, the redemptive value of Indians lay not in actual people, but in the artifacts they had once produced in a more authentic stage of existence. This helps explain why, though he did involve Indian people in assembling the collection for display at the Whitney, Fetter didn't consider them an important resource for interpretation. Despite his claim that he had selected objects, quote, anyone can relate to, his exhibition and catalog didn't take into consideration the possibility of Native people being in his audience. Fetter did make use of Native people as exhibition assistants. Mrs. Ida Luhan Isaacs and Louis Mofsey, um, shown here. Isaacs, who hailed from Taos Pueblo, was the founder of Indian House Recordings, an important producer of traditional music and a local leader in Pueblo education and politics. Mopsy, who, was Hopi and, who is Hopi and Winnebago, is the founder of Thunderbird American Indian Dancers in New York City and past chairman of the Board of American Indian Community House. Isaac and Mopsy were hired to help secure loans from collections in the regions in which they lived, and nothing more. Better wrote to Bauer that, quote, in spite of the fact that our two Indian assistants have not helped considerably in organizing the exhibit, they will both be of great value in avoiding any problems with the red power people in New York or elsewhere. At the time, American Indian movement activists were occupying federal land on Alcatraz, an island off San Francisco that had been used as a penitentiary, including for native leaders who opposed the US government policies in the 19th century. Fetter's personal politics are little known. Uh, however, close associates suggest that he may have been disaffected by the growing Indian militancy and antagonism of the 1970s. Yet, the increased visibility of Native Americans in 1970 was likely the inspiration for the show. The original idea for the exhibition came from Nina Caden Wright of the PR firm Ruder and Finn. Ruder and Finn worked closely with the American tobacco firm Philip Morris, which had used the sponsorship of exhibitions to elevate its public profile beginning in 1965, a year after it was conclusively demonstrated that smoking was linked to lung cancer. 
Corporate sponsorship helped arts organizations during a time of limited public and private funding and has been particularly valuable as a form of advertising for Morris and other tobacco companies due to the banning of cigarette ads on television and radio. Morris continues to be a major corporate sponsor um, under the name of its parents' company, Altria, despite many attacks on this practice as art washing. Philip Morris originally sponsored exhibitions of contemporary art, but they were expanding in 1970 um, and found, uh, in particular, an interest in exhibitions with an historic American focus appealing. After 200 years, the corporation went on to sponsor the Whitney's Flowering of American Folk Art in 1974, as well as projects at Colonial Williamsburg and the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. It funded two traveling exhibits of indigenous American art in the 1970s, and in the same decade, the tobacco company also supported two major exhibitions of African American art, Contemporary Black Artists in 1971, and Two Centuries of Black Art in 1976. The latter was one of three bicentennial projects that seemed design, designed to model a new broader inclusiveness in the definition of American art. The other two were Frontier America, which included work by both native and settler artists, and Remember the Ladies, an historical exhibition focused on women of the Revolutionary Era. In 1976, Morris and its affiliates contributed $42.2 million to cultural products, projects. Importantly, Corporate President George Weissman shared the goal of expanding the definition of American art with Director Bauer, who was at the, in the same years uh, expanding the scope of the Whitney's programming to include more shows by women artists, self-taught artists, and contemporary black artists. And indeed, that several of those shows are just listed. While these efforts can be seen as significant contributions to the transformation of the American canon, Marketing, marketing was really the driver. The 1979 book, Art in Business, The Philip Morris Story, stated that in a survey of 417 chairmen and presidents, only 10% said the goal of their investment in the arts was to promote a pluralistic society, while 32% admitted it was good PR. Weissman found, found ways to connect each of these efforts back to the corporation. For example, in his foreword to the catalog for 200 years, he wrote, quote, at Philip Morris, we have a great debt to repay to North American Indians on several scores. The first is as Americans, and the second is as businessmen. For it was the North American Indians who first cultivated tobacco and helped found the oldest industry in the New World. This highly Eurocentric view of indigenous relations with a sacred plant is typical of the way the exhibition avoided presenting its audience with indigenous perspectives. <clears throat> in addition to financial support, Wright was uh, involved in securing loans, crafting the opening panel for the show, and developing the PR strategy. She may also, at this time, have been pandering to contemporary audiences in framing an interest in native culture from an environmentalist perspective. Likely at her suggestion, Weissman's introduction to the catalog also stated, quote, the North American Indian has always been an instinctive environmentalist who never separated man from nature. This was just a year after the debut of PSAs to, quote, keep America beautiful by limiting pollution, which featured an Italian actor playing a crying native man in ceremonial dress. Caden clearly understood the moment's penchant for using Indian people as national symbols. She also knew that Native art at the time was garnering record-breaking prices at Christie's and Sotheby's. The show was largely well-received. Connoisseur called it, quote, one of the most rewarding and surprising exhibitions to have been seen in New York this season. Reviewers did not question that Native American art belonged at an American art museum. In fact, one wrote, quote, nothing seems more logical. One only wonders why it didn't happen a long time ago, characterizing the gesture perhaps as belated. At the same time, others found the decision to provide no context for the significance of the works as a foolish, castrated approach. Elizabeth Stevens of the Wall Street Journal criticized the generalizing tendencies of using a cultural area approach and found the modernist style of presentation of isolated objects 
offered for aesthetic appreciation with little explanation problematic. Several reviews began with a reversal of American colonial violence, offering criticism of history, but also the hope that these di the difficult feelings raised by the exhibit could lead to true understanding of another culture, perhaps without that contextual understanding. Robert Hughes uh, critiqued, quote, white's guilty and eclectic benevolence, which springs from an apparently insatiable desire to consume fresh art. Carter Ratcliffe claimed, this show is a political event as much as anything else. The, the, like last season's show of contemporary black artists at the Whitney, and Ratcliffe called out the museum for limiting the selection to a so-called historical period. So-called was his phrase. Uh, but perhaps he was aware of alternate temporalities in different cultures. The black artist show Ratcliffe referenced was Contemporary Black Artists in America, organized in response to artist activist group Black Emergency Cultural Coalition's protests of the museum. The BECC began protesting at the Whitney in November 1968 to protest the absence of black artists in a survey exhibition of American art of the 1930s. The protest and its coverage resulted in a meeting with Whitney leadership to discuss the BECC's demand for black representation in Whitney's solo and group exhibitions, including one show of explicitly black artists in the 1970-71 season, the acquisition of more work by black artists for the permanent collection, and the hiring of black curatorial staff. The BEC boycotted the Philip Morris-sponsored contemporary black artists because the museum failed to adhere to two of its demands that black art experts be involved in its organization, and that the exhibition take place during the winter, New York's high season for art. As Carolyn Wallace and Kelly Jones have explained, while many of these demands were met over the next few years, in partial ways perhaps, black artists continued to be marginalized at the Whitney, in part because of its failure to hire black staff. An indigenous response to the Whitney show that takes a cue from the BEC came from Lloyd Oxendine, a Lundy painter, curator, and gallerist who was an important early advocate for contemporary Native artists. In 1972, in response to the restricted history conveyed by 200 years, Oxendine organized an exhibition of contemporary Native artists at the Community Gallery in, in the Brooklyn Art Museum, a gallery directed by Henry Ghent, a prominent leader of the BECC. Oxendine also presented a portfolio related to the exhibition in the summer 1972 issue of Art in America, an issue that was entirely dedicated to Native American representation and politics. This gesture was also perceived as a protest of the show. And here's just a Oxendine's um, uh, portfolio is here. He claimed that it was um, uh, it, meeting Brian Doherty at the black tie opening of the exhibition that he planted the seed in Brian's uh, mind to um, to dedicate this issue. Although again, I think marketing played a role in the decision. Much has changed in museums in the past five decades, not least being the lead of time needed to prepare an exhibition. Contemporary reinstallations mentioned at the beginning of this talk were not suggested by a corporate corporation's PR firm. In fact, many museums made use of grant funding from nonprofit organizations dedicated to helping arts organizations diversify their permanent collection galleries in the wake of the Black Lives Matter and the two movements, both of which um, explicitly critiqued museums. Um, and the Terra Foundation has been um, extraordinarily generous in this regard. But are museums today necessarily de delivering on the unfulfilled project of 50 years ago or reproducing its performativity? Time does not allow for a detailed exploration of individual reinstallations, but I will point out some of the trends for consideration, and maybe we'll discuss them later. Um, first, uh, several institutions are integrating Native American artworks into galleries organized chronologically according to conventions of US history. This runs the risk, of course, of, uh, of not telling Native histories from their own perspective. Some have created separate galleries for Native art within their American wings and have retained a culture area organization. This is a shot from the Metropolitan. Um, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts has done the same, and both of these um, have been criticized for putting Native art in the basement, um, reinforcing a notion of chronological development as you rise through the floors into um, 
more uh, historically um, proximal moments in the upper galleries. Um, in many cases, these decisions result from the fact that art, the art museums have small, uneven collections of Native American art. At the same time, some institutions have dedicated resources to collecting contemporary indigenous art and installed it in ways that add context for and critical perspective on their Anglo-centric permanent collections. And this is a project by Alan Michelson um, about George Washington called uh, Hannah de Gaius, which town destroyer, which is the Haudenosaunee name for George Washington, who during the Seven Years' War was known for burning the fields of indigenous people on his, in his military campaigns. Um, and he's mounted a bust of Washington on top of a surveyor's tripod because Washington also worked as a surveyor helping to um, uh, uh, appropriate indigenous land. And it's situated in a, a colonial wars gallery at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. Um, <clears throat> According to Ruth Phillips and Kathleen Ash Milby, exhibitions of Native art since 1992 have tended to stress the value of inclusion at the expense of incorporating Native visual sovereignty. As they write, broadening installations through following the liberal values of recognition and inclusion, quote, fails to disturb ongoing colonial power relations between dominant and marginalized cultures within the museum and the larger society. This situation has led the School of uh, Advanced Research to produce uh, the standards for museums with Native American collections, a document recently presented at the American Alliance of Museums, uh, designed to inform museums about the unique status of tribal governments and sovereignty as one of their key goals. Another goal is to recognize the colonial legacy of museums and provide opportunities to educate about this history and its ongoing impact on Native people. Without taking up this work seriously, contemporary museums may be engaging in exercises in diversifying that inherit some of the problems of the Whitney 50 years ago. A vital means of upsetting museum power relations is the incorporation of Native perspectives in the creation of exhibitions. Um, and this work is going on at many of the institutions that I've just mentioned and, and will definitely yield results in the future. It has involved creating relationships with local Native communities, convening long-term advisory groups comprised of Indigenous experts in culture and history, and creating permanent empowered positions for Native people in curatorial departments. The most provocative recent exhibitions of Native art within an American context include This Land at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College and On the Ground at the Peabody Essex, which I just showed you. These are arranged thematically rather than chronologically, and they use the themes to open up questions rather than convey information. In fact, these exhibitions don't so much integrate indigenous works in the category of American art but instead challenge us to consider how the latter should be understood. And for my final slide, this is outside the gallery at the Peabody Essex, which does no longer calls these galleries their American galleries, but instead says Native American and American. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for being here um, these last two days. Um, I will be thinking about these talks uh, in, on their own and also in dialogue with the previous events in the series um, for a long time. Um, and um, you've raised so many wonderful both case studies and um, examples <laughs> of, and also and also raised really crucial um, questions and themes. Um, and so my last comments are meant to be things for kind of carrying away from this conversation and kind of moving into a kind of macro scale that is probably totally unmanageable. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, thinking about birthdays as Alexis raised and life and the memory of it compressed as um, Nick brought in. When we become aware of ourselves in the present, and this is something William James and Henry Bergson wrote about beautifully, that moment of awareness of our present is always belated to us in our own experiential flow. So in that way, consciousness, we could say, is perhaps belated. 
this may prompt us to wonder, is belatedness everywhere in our own experience, even if we are unaware? Um, is belatedness also embedded beyond these kinds of cultural politics, but also in the field of art history itself? We could consider that all um, of the art discipline is operating under a frame of belatedness, because every object of study is relatively belated to our perception or our interpretation and engagement of it. And in this, I've been thinking about um, Slavoj Zizak's writing about parallax as a way to understand this temporal gap between the processes of production and circulation, a kind of parallax between the, um, that moment and our moment. Um, and this is a term that refers to a kind of di displacement in perception that is related to the positionality of the viewer. So for instance, how the distance or depth of objects may appear to vary when viewed from different lines of sight or like when you're driving in a car and the things that are really close to you flash past and the things that are really far in the distance seem to pass more slowly. That's a good example of a parallax. So this construct, this construct depends on, for Zizak, a quote, future anterior, retroactively actualized and performatively enacted. And so I start to wonder if our whole field is perpetually negotiating these tensions. And maybe this plays out through some arguments in our field about historicism versus presentism. Um, thinking also about Paul Giles, a literary scholar who writes about a backgazing, um, kind of turning the world upside down from an antipodian context. And I wonder if um, our field's emphasis on kind of linear chronology and documentation at times may be a repression of um, acknowledging that own temporal position in ways that might fundamentally shape our practice. But it is also true, based on everything I just said, that in using the term in this way, it perhaps becomes unwieldy. And I think it could also collapse under a weight of universality in which it becomes meaningless. Um, and I think some of the speakers across the series um, showed the sort of limitations of the concept of the belated um, in the cases that they worked through. And I think this speaks to our mingling of these layered and mutable concepts of culture and time pushing us into very deep water, um, uh, uh, theoretically. I think the term might also buckle under interpretive pressure because, and this speaks to Joanna's question just a few minutes ago, it may seem to operate without human actors. It's kind of like free-floating discourse hanging in the air, uh, floating above and around cultural production like a specter in ways that might push us to assume that it is a dangerous projection or a myth we risk reifying by talking about it. Um, but my conclusion in my own art practice, art historical practice, and I think it's really affirmed by listening to your interventions, um, is the extent to which these, um, this concept is often agentically taken up by human actors, both historical and contemporary, um, as they seek to navigate complex cultural politics of transnational exchange, the shaping of contours of fields um, from our own perspectives, and also the selective boundaries of inclusion and exclusion within the histories that we write. It is individuals, our artists, our case studies, ourselves, who give currency, utility, and meaning to the concept, spotlighting those desires and tracing their material and real world <laughs> implications continues to be the focus of our discussion. Thank you so much, and I'll look forward to further conversations with all of you. Thank you.